G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of Fat Chat. I'm super excited to have an amazing, talented sportswoman next to me. I know her from way back. She plays for the Collingwood Magpies AFLW team. Uh, she's a dual AFLW All-Australian. She's a, a Fox Fox Sports presenter, and I'm super excited to have her in today. Please welcome Ruby Schleicher. Welcome to Fat Chat. Thank you, Jared. Wow, what a what a rev up you've given ah, to me. Ah, it is so good to see you. Oh, so uh, good to we see you. We, it's been ages. It has been ages. We actually go way back. So um, how we know each other is that my younger sister Elise. You guys used to play basketball together. Yeah, back when we were, what, six years old, I reckon? Yeah, we were, and for, you for were the ages. assistant coach. I was the assistant basically. coach. See, yeah. that was literally my first coaching I gig. I know, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Everyone yeah. that has, <laughs> you, has ever done PTing with Jared, I mean, I made him who he is today. I, so. don't, I don't think I taught you anything about basketball. <laughs> no, you're at old any man, point. Though, Richard. Richard, behind who's behind the, the lens, camera right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, Richard. I owe everything to Richard. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't think at any point I taught you. I don't really, any, no, either of us. You were a good rebounder. A rebounder, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep chucking the shots yeah, up, Ruby. That's it. Pretty much the game plan was for those junior days: just give Ruby the ball, and everyone <laughs> fucking get out of the way. <laughs> Elise, don't bother. Don't yeah. bother. Everybody else, get out. Just give it to Ruby. No, you can always rely on Elise. <laughs> it's good. Give it to her. She passed back to me. It was perfect. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, I w- we also know you. You know your family quite well. Um, your brother uh, Jake, um, and your uh, your two sisters Mia and Jess. And uh, I've got a couple of things that they've sent in um, that I'm going to oh, bring up to you. <laughs> This will be good. So uh, I've reached out to them uh, and uh, they've they've sent me through a couple of bits and pieces. So the first one I've got, is it true that you're a little bit of a shifty Nutella dealer back in the day out of your room? Is that right? So apparently... Apparently, yes. you weren't allowed to have Nutella in the house, so you'd have Nutella <laughs> under the bed, yeah. and everybody would come in and get their little scrape for yes. Ruby. Is that right? So we were like, we've got like one of those almond mums, you know, the mums that it's like I don't know how they live off like a boiled egg a day, <laughs> right? <laughs> An and so mum. yeah, you know how they I've call them never, that. Like I've the never heard that. Mums, yeah, wow. so a pretty healthy household. So like, whenever you'd go to a mate's place that has like shitty food, you'd you'd be in you're heaven. Going, yes. Oh yeah, you'd you'd be in your element. But um, every birthday you'd choose what you what your birthday brekkie was, and so you'd get other like brekkie. yeah your birthday brekkie like your pancakes or whatever. But after like when as you get older, you realise if you ask for Nutella, you're never using a, a jar of Nutella in the morning, right? You get yes. the medium size, and it's going to last you over last a little while. So smart. So I started asking for Nutella. And everyone else caught on as well. But my little sister, Mia, you know Mia? Yes. She, um, she used to come in and be before school and I'd hide it from mum because I knew if mum knew I was eating Nutella every morning, Get it she'd in. be getting it off me, you know, give me an almond instead. But um, she, Mia used to come to my door, <laughs> knock on my door with her toast, right? She'd have her toast ready. Please go Knock on my door. Yeah. It was literally, it was like a sus little dealer. <laughs> and I've, I've just got my Nutella and I'm like, shh, I'm going to get in. <laughs> she'd come in I'd spread Nutella really scarcely because I want oh, this to last for me it's not about no, me it's not about it's you yeah 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 it's so going to last I'd, you I'd, until next birthday you know, exactly so I'd spread it on there and I'd be like get out <laughs> that's awesome. So I was. I was the household Nutella dealer the next one I've got is it true or not true that um, when you're about 12 your dad convinced you that it in Perth <laughs> that it was about to snow. <laughs> so you've gone, fantastic. How good is this? You've run outside. You've grabbed a carrot from the pantry mm. and you've gone sat outside for two hours waiting for the fucking snow yeah. to come and the snow never came. Oh, is that right? Look, I definitely wasn't home for my brains. Um, I was, the nickname my family gave me for a while there was Walnut because they reckon I was just like, the brain like my brain was a walnut like there was just nothing going on in there um so just tell me about that so was it was it winter was it like was yeah, it cloudy or was I it think a sunny it was just day really cold it was a really cold day and i yet yeah, probably old enough to know better but i fully dad just said you know it's gonna snow tonight and <laughs> my little sister right is five years younger than me so she probably has an excuse me not so much but he, oh my god it's so cold he's like yeah it's gonna snow it doesn't it's never snow it Perth doesn't once snow ever. for anybody that hasn't been, it doesn't <laughs> yeah, snow there exactly yeah. um and me and mia i reckon waited at the glass door with a scarf and carrots for couple hours and we we're just waiting <laughs> we're just like staring into the abyss waiting to see this snowfall so <laughs> that's so mean yeah i know that is so mean by yeah. steve oh my god that's awesome just speaking on weather stuff though how was the earthquake last night here i shat myself <laughs> so i'm by myself in my apartment at the moment my housemates over in ireland when i say that was one of the scariest things 
ever. I it fully woke me up. Like eleven forty five. I'm in I'm going into REM. I'm ready to Yeah, <laughs> me like, too. None eyes. And the whole bed was moving. And then I almost I fell back asleep and I almost convinced myself it was a dream. Yeah. And then I woke That's up and what was, happened to me. Yeah. So I was I was um in the, the bedroom here. I've just gone to sleep. And then I wake myself up and I was, ah, I screamed, right? And then I was sat there for a bit and went, wow, did I just have a nightmare? Yeah. That was really weird. And I just sat there for 10 minutes and was like, just trying to process. And it was so loud. It was like, it was like all the windows shaking, everything. I was like, that was Yeah. And then I woke up going, what the fuck? And then I came and dad was still um, uh, watching TV. So I came on out and I was like, did I just scream? He's like. Yeah, you did, but the whole house shook. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Bizarre. Oh, my that God. That shit doesn't happen in Perth. No. It doesn't snow, no nah. earthquakes. The, the, ground, the ground stays exactly where Melbourne it's supposed to. Melbourne always has to be different. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck those headphones on. I've got one more for you. Oh, it's a little voice um, a mail that um, Mia sent in. Oh, no. <laughs> she was just- okay, so when me and Ruby were in high school together, mum had given me a $2 coin and hadn't given Ruby anything because she was always getting grounded. Um, and I always went and got naughty. garlic cheesy and was walking <laughs> was walking on one side of the quad and I turn around because I feel someone looking at me and Ruby's on the other side of the quad pointing at me. <laughs> so I start running away. <laughs> She's chased me down, thrown me into a brick wall and oh. taken my cheesy out of my hand and walked off. So and mean. no teacher even did anything. So what? ask her about that. That is so mean. Why would you do that to your sister? Because... Mum wouldn't give me money. It's that <laughs> typical, like, youngest <laughs> child. Like, I had to work for everything. I had two older siblings. Would never No handouts. But then Mia came along and she's, you know, look after the baby. So she'd get to go to the canteen with things. And it was – I remember her backpack, like, she was a tiny little thing. And I was, I was year 12 and she was year 8. And she was like – this backpack was – Three, qu- yeah, three yeah. quarters of it. So when she was trying to run away, it was like clipping at her heels. She couldn't. Get <laughs> so I just spotted her a hundred meters away, and I just go, "You, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming for you." <laughs> and I've legged it. And the, yeah, the teachers were like, oh, "It's one of the slashes." So oh. they were fine. They're like, oh, they, it's they, fine. They'd it's all in the family. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like it was it wasn't a problem. But oh, yeah, that's no. amazing. So um, good. Well, thank you very much um, uh, for all the slashes for uh, <laughs> sending that in. They were great. Thanks very much. And Jake, stop drinking all the fucking beers off the craft and get yourself. Can back you get down a bit older? I reckon he's chucked on a couple of I was going to say, he needs to, get, he needs to get down yeah, to the body know, magic again. Body I'll magic. give him a you message. You looked after him for a while there. Can you do <laughs> it, it again? Looking, he was looking schmick yeah, for a bit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he needs a, body magic does karate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's go right back because you've had a remarkable career so far. You're one of the pioneers in, you know, the AFLW in terms of, you know, football, but then also your media career and all these other great things that you got going on. It's it's unreal. I can't wait to hear all about it. Uh, And we're going to talk about what it really takes to be an elite AFL athlete and all the training and everything as well a little bit later on. So let's just go right back. Tell us a little bit about you growing up. Obviously, it sounds like you're super cool. you are super close with your family. Um, sounds like a real fun household to uh, grow up in. Tell us a little about you growing up. Um, well, I mean, you know, you guys know the slashes. We're a very loud household, which is Always probably hence, yeah. Yeah, hence why I'm the way I am. You sort of had to shout over, out over everyone to get a word in. But, um, yeah, super close with my family, the six of us all up. And, um, yeah, basically started out playing footy. Jake, the oldest, my brother, he was playing footy and dad was his coach all the way through juniors. I was kicked to under 18s and I remember when he was playing and I was probably, you know, four or five How years old. How much older is Jake than you? Five uh, years? Five years, yeah. yeah. So he was, yeah, oh, he was probably playing under 10s or something like that and I was just kind of, I remember dad putting a footy in my hand and all I wanted was to join him with the boys training sessions and yeah. I was a tiny little thing so that wasn't going to happen but as soon as dad could, he was like, righto, let's get her into Auskick and um, I was, yeah, obviously the only girl down at Willerton Blues. So having a run around and, um, you know, playing basketball as well from the age of five, doing your little clinics and all that sort of thing. So from uh, when I can remember, it was always ball sports, yeah. whether it was basketball or footy. And um, You're just a gun at everything. Oh, I was, well, I obviously didn't have <laughs> brains, so there was had to be something that I excelled in. Um, but, yeah, no, I just loved it. And so I, I probably thinking about, like, I, I loved them both, but I really loved footy. Yeah. And to me, I remember being in primary school and you'd, they'd be like, what are you going to be when you're older? And I remember writing down um, the first female, like, first girl to play AFL. Did but I, actually- I didn't mean – I didn't mean – with women, I fully in had the like, 
in the guys' league, right? Which, like, obviously you grow up and you go, obviously not going to happen. You know, it's That's just amazing. never going to happen. But for me, I didn't see a difference because I was – Because you were playing. I was playing anyway. and I was good against the boys, you know. Nice. Like, I was always in that age group. I was always one of the better players on the team. So I never thought that I was – wasn't going to be able to compete with the boys as I got older. Yeah. Um, so for me, I just remember, it was like, oh no, I'm going to play against Ben Cousins, and I'm going to, you know you think yes. these things when you're you know seven years old because you don't know any better. Um, and then yeah, just played up until under 11s, um, and then I was only going to be able to play one more year until I had to stop because we. I mean, everyone knows the story for m- most of the girls. Is It's under 12 ki- is when the, like, yeah, the cutoff was, was hey? I th- yeah, under 12s. I th- a lot of the girls now only play with girls because there's so many playing now. The yes. grassroots has grown ridic- ridiculously. But at the time it was like under 12 under was 12 kind of like where it was the cutoff. Yeah, right? that's yep. it. So, But for me, that under 12s year, footy and basketball, we're going to start cutting each other out. Yep. So it was like, righto, well, no brainer, I'm going to – Basketball could take me somewhere. Because there wasn't any career, for, there no, wasn't I, any pathway. I was going to have to stop playing after the next year for footy. So, um, yeah, it was just basketball. So, it was really upsetting to obviously leave footy behind, especially with my, my team. Like, those boys were all like my brothers. Um, so, that was probably, that was really devastating. But basketball from there really took the stage. And my whole um, junior years was like, this is going to be my career, yep. which is hence why I gave school no effort. <laughs> like, because I went, and it wasn't until later when I was thinking, all right, I'm going to college here, yada, yada, that I went, shit, I probably tr- should have tried harder in school because, you know, that's where, what they actually do look at. Yep. Um, but my whole teen years, everything, everything I worked towards was to be a professional basketball player. Yep. Um, and then it wasn't until I was 16 and – I think I was having a – I was – my brother was playing Waffle Fee Free at the time and I'd always go watch with Dad and we'd take our own footy and we'd kick on the oval at quarter time, half time, just, you know, have a fun kick around. And an old fella from East Frio went up to my dad and said, geez, she, she's a good she's kick. Bad, yeah. yeah, she's a good kick. I and mean, she ever played? And he goes, oh, yeah, when, in juniors. And, um, and he goes, you know, there's a, a girls' team they started and we had no idea. So um, what year was this roughly? What year I was school probably, were you? Uh, probably 15, 16 years old. Mm. Um but, like, basketball had my attention. Yep. But it was – yeah, it was like, you know, there's girls' teams now. So I was probably 16 and I went down and had a look at East Frio and was like, this is really cool. Um, and then whenever I could, I'd jump in for their youth girls' game. So if it crossed over with basketball, basketball took priority. Some days it was footy first and then basketball in the Arvo. So a Sunday I'd wake up at – I'd, I'd play at 10 a.m. and then I'd play a basketball game at 12.30. Yep. You know, like it was it was jam-packed and I absolutely loved it. But if it ever crossed over, basketball, basketball took – Basketball was what exactly. you were for, yeah. And then a few opportunities came up. I mean, women's footy was probably still at the, at the stage where if you had a bit of – natural skill if you can kick a footy you're going to get an opportunity somewhere so they had the WA State Academy and they were like all right it, what training sessions can you make if it, and I was doing state basketball at the time I did um you know under 16s two years of under 18s um and they were just kind of like whenever we can have you come Good down yep. and I think I went to three training sessions and then went and played for WA in the state footy for under 18s um which was in Mandra. It was just kind of like it was at the stage where, yeah, if you can play, we'll chuck you in. Yep. Um, where now it's like it's it's so hard work to get in. Oh like, yeah, like the girls are so talented. It's really like competitive. Where back then it was kind of like, oh, you can kick footy, come on down, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll take you away to Melbourne with us, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then it, yeah, it, that's sort of how my, all my teen years unfolded Amazing. until. Uh, yeah, a couple injuries kind of changed the pathway for me. Unreal. And then sort of going back to like you playing basketball because you're a star basketball player. So you were playing uh, at school. You were at Williton High School as part of the basketball program there. You played as you were playing or trained with the SBL. Yeah, I, I was training. I, I was Willington? training with the SBL from when I was like 14 years yeah. old, and then go in and play wobble and rep Which basketball. Which is very, and stuff. very young to be training with, like you know, the the open SBL team. Yeah, I think. Well, like you kind of. I, I wasn't playing at that stage, but I think that was so good for me because you, yep. you'd spend the whole summer, but you know, outside of your season, three days a week, you're chucked in there. You're playing it. Like training against girls like Kate Malpass and all these girls, Ebony Antonio was yeah, in there, guns, these freak yeah. basketballers who I used to look up to, you know. So that was um, really helped my development as well. And then SBL, um, when it came to my year, 
I that's when I got injured and I was struggling to stay on the court and yes. struggling to get through trainings and stuff. So, um, yeah, struggled to play games. And then on that with your injury, so that's the back injury that, that you had? Yeah. Yep. So when at what point did that happen? How did that happen, number one? Uh, and then what effect did that have on you in terms of, you know, when you were thinking, okay, I'm going to be a professional basketballer or I'm going to go to college and I've got all these great opportunities. How did that all change for you from that injury? So it was under 18s. It was top level 18s. And it was probably my last chance to try and, you know, put yourself out there for scouts, whether it's Australian scouts or um, college scouts, all that sort of thing. And I, it was – they used to do WA – country. I was playing WA Metro. I was the captain of the team, um, as I said, last carnival, and we were playing the scratch match against WA Country before yep. you go away for the competition. And I think we were going to Ballarat or something that year, two weeks before we were going away. And I went up – for a layup and got fouled pretty heavy and came down uneven on my feet. And I remember being like, oh, that was really sore. Just like a jar kind just of thing like you're a, thinking. Yeah, just an uneven, like, awkward mm-hmm. landing. Um, didn't go to ground or anything, just with, almost landed on my heels, just a real impact sort of landing. And played the rest of the game, was really sore, but played the rest of the game and pulled up really sore from that game. And then I was struggling to get – we obviously went away and – got really strong painkillers to get through the game. I don't think we got it scanned beforehand to see what we were working with. I think we were like, we'll just You're deal just with it. You're just thinking it was just like a, yeah, good. it was a little bit sore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we were kind of pumping myself with painkillers to get through the game. So I remember the first game of the competition, I was, we were playing Northern Territory and I played four minutes and basically crawled off the court. I was in such a bad way. I was so sore um, and that was all I could play for that game. I think the most... I got through that tournament was against Vic Country. I played a half and then I was done. Yep. So it completely fucked my tournament. Yep. Like, and I was devastated. Turns out I had a stress fracture in my back. We got <sighs> back, we got scans um, and I had a stressy, which now because I continued to play on that, that's actually turned into this thing called a, a, a pars defect. So that little, I guess, crack will always be there. Um, Is that right? So you still still got that? Well, I still got it. It doesn't affect me anymore I, I might get pretty tight and it can feel grumbly but it didn't affect me like it did for a couple of years after when I probably wasn't fit enough carrying a little bit too much weight wasn't strong enough around the core that really that hurt it made, you know, made it worse 100% yeah. I'd yeah. be coming off in footy training sessions being like oh fuck like this is really cooked I don't know how I'm gonna get through it um when now it doesn't affect me as much because I've learned how to straight manage it, it and yeah, yeah a few yeah. years in the system and stuff um but yeah so that was the first one and then fast forward sort of rehab oh, I've never really slowed up a whole lot that was the tricky thing so it's it's mani- hard with like the stress fracture ones like that because it's like oh because you kind of know it's not going to do it re- it's not going to make it really 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 bad yeah and it's like ah, oh, it's not enough to completely stop doing stuff so you're kind of just on the verge of just wanting to get back into it as soon as possible exactly huh? and i think because i i actually went away after that basketball tournament a couple of weeks later i went away and played state footy oh so which was in manja <laughs> so so we went away and did that just fucking stop yes. yeah. um and then yeah they went on to play state footy and for some reason it felt better it, it felt better on the grass and it did on the court and yep. i like i think it's just the change of direction on on a basketball court like i think that cooked it where in footy you know you're running longer distances you're even though you're getting hit, you're bracing for the hit. So it hurts so much more playing basketball than it did playing footy. Wow, so that's somehow crazy. I semi made it through that competition. Um, and then six fast forward six months later, we were in the wobble grand final against Perry Lakes. Same thing. Last time of our we had a really good wobble team all the way through. Amy Atwell, who's now yep. doing boomers stuff. Uh, sorry, um, Opal stuff. We yep. had a really great team. And um it was our last grand final against Perry Lakes, who were like our you know, Rivals, arch nemesis. Yeah. 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 And um, I remember the warm up feeling pretty sore and be like, oh no, like I haven't, you know, all year I've gotten through wobble. It's all good. And then we ended up losing in overtime or something like that. And then the next day I went for a surf with my auntie and my mum, literally just at, I think it was at Port Beach. Yep. And I've gone to like get up on my board, just the push up. And I remember being like, oh, that was so that really sore. Hurt. Came in, was laying on the beach, being like, I'm, I'm in so much pain laying here 
and mum being a nurse, no sympathy at all. Oh, you'll be right, <laughs> you, know, you know how it goes. It was, oh, mate, we will shake it off. So mum there going, mum, I really need to go. Laying on no. this uneven sand, feeling like I'm going to cry. Oh. Um, and then turns out the other side, so same level but other side, also fractured under stress. Oh my and God. that one and had me w- laid up. W- was that from the game before, do you think? Or, so. or from actually it just was, pushing it, that it one bit from pushing it? It obviously wasn't just strong enough yeah. and probably the other side got affected from that first one. Yeah. So just an unevenness, not rehabbing correctly. You're 17 years old, so you don't really know what you need to do for your body to get yourself right yeah. after an injury like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it was just kind of – it was like, nah, you've put me under so much pressure – that's it. So, and that one had me laid up. Like the other one, I just kept going. That one was just I remember sleeping in agony and being like in so much pain, laid up, being like, "This is this Ugh. sucks." Um, and when I had that second one, I was obviously in talks with colleges and stuff and figuring out my opportunities. And I was still dead set on yeah, I'm going over to America. And I told them about the first back fracture, and they're like, right keeps up to date, yada, yada, and then um, told them the second one and they just weren't going to take a chance on a a 17-year-old kid, an international – Of course, yeah. For a four-year scholarship that can't stay on the court. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that was kind of, I guess, where the shift happened in my career. I I remember literally going through a crisis – being like, it must have been that stressful because, oh. like, you've just built up and done all this work, and that's been, like you said, the pathway and the goal for such a long time. Seriously, for you, to yeah. then get to that point that you know, and it's, it's all just gone. It's so funny though because it's I, I look back now and I remember being in this crisis, sitting in my bedroom, bawling my eyes out. And Mum reminds me of this when I got the job at Fox. Mum reminded me of this. Obviously, it's all her. Um, <laughs> she came. She came in. She goes, "Roops, I've just got a feeling." She was like. Because oh, I'm devastated. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. That typical post-school, yep. what is life sort of stress. She goes, I've just got a feeling you're going to you're gonna get out of Perth. It's going to be for a sport. It, it is going to be for a sport. One of your sports, footy, basketball, I don't know. And you're going to get into the media. She goes, you're going to get you're gonna get into the media and that's going to be you. But you're getting out of Perth. And I, like, I, at the time I'm obviously like, shut up, mum. Like, <laughs> what do you know? You know, like, thinking it's so ridiculous. She's called that very and well. Mate, hasn't she? She's nailed it. So my, my, mum knows. You that's know? unreal. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. A very defining moment, I think, in my, in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And then from that, when did you then switch the focus over to football? Like, once you rehabbed, you're back on. Yeah, well, throughout this period, I was, I was playing – East Fremantle, youth girls, yep. all that sort of thing. And um, over that summer, so did my second fracture, then went into – I was 17. Over that summer was, yeah, both basketball and footy doing – that was my year for SBL, yep. struggling to stay on the court, like training sessions, sitting on the sidelines being like, I can't do this, um, was way too sore. But then going to footy and not feeling sore yep. and being like, oh, this is, is all right. Yeah, mm. this is a bit weird. Um, and then this was my first year of league for East Fremantle. So, yeah, 18 years old. And I think that's probably where it started to really? to take over because yeah, I yeah, was yeah. – SPL, I wasn't playing. I, I couldn't play. And footy, I was, you know, playing – we were in a really good team. We made the grand final that year and um, – yeah, I was loving my footy as well and it was probably the first time that I'd taken it seriously yep. in a long time. Um, and then at what point was there the talks of the AFLW becoming a league? Like was, was that already before you kind of committed to or went back to footy or was that as you were – like literally you're back and then all of a sudden there's all these talks about it or – I reckon it was that year, literally the year that – it got drafted. Obviously, there were the exhibition games like the Melbourne versus yep. Bulldogs, all that sort of thing in the previous years. But everything you heard was 2023. Mm-hmm. They're going to have a competition in 2023. And so that this year, imagine, like I'm in, I'm coming into my eighth season, crazy. which is crazy to think about in 2023. This was – we thought there wasn't going to be a competition until 2023. And um, it was like, all right, it's happening in 23. And then all of a sudden it went, right, there's a draft, end of 2016. And – you're like, holy shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, literally that was me. So I was – that year for East Free, I was playing as like a a, a ruck back mid forward, sort of wherever they needed yeah. me. But um, you're like, I'm, I'm five foot nine. I'm not a ruck, but I just used to jump, you just know. Just do whatever. So just put Do whatever me in. I yeah. could, yeah, and then play as an extra mid. And my – so like just by chance, my coach, Steph, um, her partner, Webbo, 
was who they were both involved with East Fremantle. Webbo got asked to go and be Collingwood AFLW's first midfield coach for that for that year, and she, she called me and said, "Do you and Dad want to come meet me for a coffee?" So me and my dad Steve went and met her um, cafe across from East Fremantle, and she goes, "Look, I'm going over to I'm going over and and coaching Collingwood. Like this draft is happening. I want you to come over and." and come over with me like when yeah yeah. and these coaches she didn't know any of these coaches that were they were all Victorian coaches that were coaching the AFLW so they just kind of took her word for that and I didn't really believe it I was like well like yeah of course but I didn't believe it until I had Wayne Siegman the first ever coach calling me it sounds like because it just sort of had like it's it was snowballed so quickly it was this coffee it was uh, we played you know playing East Fremantle make the grand final I think we lost like four points to Cara Dinellon and Ebony Antonio yeah, yeah, and those yeah, girls. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm having a coffee with Webber and she's saying, I want you to move to Melbourne and play for me at Collingwood. And as an 18-year-old, I'm going, what? Like, wow. this sounds ridiculous. And it was literally like that would have been impossible 12 months ago. Absolutely. Like six this? months ago. Six it was, months. Even, you Wild. know, six months ago, it was, it, it's, you know, seven years away. Mm. So that was crazy. Um, and then, then the conversation came of, okay, well, Fremantle – found out that I was talking in talks with Collingwood, as, as you do, and where the AFL women's game is at, and it's only just changed, but where it was at at that, that stage was you need to nominate for a state. Yep. So if, if I want to stay and play for Freo, I nominate for WA. If I want, if I nominate for Victoria, any of the Victorian ca- teams can pick me up. So that's not the case anymore, though? Not the case anymore. So I think if you, you can nominate for your home state if you're yep. not willing to move, or you can nominate for a national pool, yep. but you can't nominate a state. So if I now nominated yep. national, any anyone Sydney, can get you. anyone yep. can get me. So I guess I was pretty fortunate because I don't know how I would have gone going absolutely going elsewhere. Anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah. obviously now there's more financial support behind the girls than there was back then. Like I yep. made the move across making eight grand for the year. Which I was, is, well, that, that was one of my big questions I wanted to ask yeah. you because the amount of like the, the level of dedication and commitment and everything that goes into playing AFLW, it's a full-time job. Like, and, and to start off with it, and I'm sure it's the same right now that the pay for that, for the effort and the amount of effort you have to put in is probably like this still. Um, so it's just crazy that that was like eight grand for a season. Yeah, it, it was, it was pretty crazy. And I, I guess that was, I credit mum, like I wouldn't be able to do it with mum and dad's support, obviously, yep. particularly those first few years. But um, obviously ended up nominating Collingwood and choosing that over Fremantle because Fremantle were like, stay, play for us. And I went, well, mum and dad just said, you know what, Rubes, like home is always here. And if you go over there and it doesn't work out, you, can you come, back come back here and you try again, yep. you know. like you'd, So if they – hadn't have said that and didn't give him the support, I probably would have stayed and played for Freo and still be in Perth and probably be happy as Larry. Yeah. But I wouldn't have the opportunity. Have all the things that, that you've I'd, just been able to well, that's make it. yourself. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that first year it was – you. I, didn't, I got no relocation because I opted to go to Victoria. Is that right? So if you opt to do that, you don't yeah, get any Yeah, I extras. think it was – unless you were like a um, – Eight grand wouldn't even get you – like oh, your stuff here. No, <laughs> seriously. Oh, I think it was like two grand to send your oh. car with a bunch of stuff in it. So, oh my God. Yeah, it was pretty ridiculous. But yeah, eight grand to come across. I was working. It was the. It was fifteen hours a week then. So we were, you know, you're training three nights a week. But in that, we we're getting into the club at at four, and you're not leaving till eleven thirty. Yeah, right? of course. Because it was like all right, we barely get these girls, so let's stretch it out. And then you're not being fed. So I remember I didn't know how to cook. I was an 18-year-old. I was like, <laughs> you remember me? I was so yeah, annoying. Yeah, yeah. I was like this little <laughs> annoying freak. And then, so like I didn't know how to cook. For six months I ate um, – it was like lemon chicken, which was cracked lemon pepper on top of chicken Great. breast with rice, brown rice, two-minute one, and frozen veggies. But I didn't know how to just steam the bare my minimums. own yep. veggies. So just the, like, frozen, freezer packet yep, ones. Yep, yep. And, I and as much the, Nutella as you wanted as And well. as much made half a block of chocolate every night. No wonder I was a heifer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, at home you're going, Mum, can't feed me almonds anymore. <laughs> I'm eating all the chocolate in the world. <laughs> no wonder I didn't play a good game for four years. But, um, yeah, no, it, it was kind of like the – you were, you were set up to fail those yep. first few years unless you were you came in and you were one of those girls that were in, you know, that 23, 24, already a mature head um, 
in that sort of stage of Tough life life. that could come in Mm. and impact straight away. As an 18-year-old moving across, you are set up to fail in that environment because you're – I was working in a cafe. I was up at, you know, 5.30, going working in the cafe for the majority of the day, going to train – like to to pay rent because footy's not going to pay it. And then going to training and – it was just, and then Full homesickness. On. Like, of course, yeah. I was miserable for the. first And especially three when years. you're when you're working that hard because you're putting in all those hours, like you said, with your work, and then football, and you're moving away from home for the first time. Yeah. It's such massive changes that you got going on. I yeah. imagine that would have hit you pretty hard. Yeah, definitely. And I guess that that's there's still a long way to go in the women's, and I'm very fortunate now that I would be looked after a lot more than say the girls who are, who are drafted and come in, it's still a tiered system. Um, so there's girls that come in who, you know, still have have to work. But I get, for me, I'm very fortunate that my work with Fox, it's, it's the sporting world. So they're so understanding that like, all right, we want you to be the best athlete you can be. So whatever you need to do, if you need to shoot off halfway through, if you're burnt out, righto, we'll drop a day. Like that right. is literally my, how they are. And I couldn't be more blessed. That's where there's awesome. girls who don't have that, um, flexibility, that flexibility, that. yeah, yeah. And, and that understanding workplace, which is can be really hard. Absolutely, um, but yeah, I wouldn't change anything because I think all those challenges early on, the homesickness, the having to work, it made me grow up a hell of a lot faster than I would have if I stayed in Perth. So you drafted to Collingwood. You're right, part of the AFLW now. How good? So is there? How did your first game come about? And do you also have any like memorable games or anything that happened? Any any good stories you can share with us? My, well, my first game was the inaugural game, Carlton Collingwood. Oh. And, yeah. So that's the first game that ever, That was my ever. Fir- first ever game. Oh, um, how good so, is that? And I didn't think I was going to play. I was the youngest on the list. Yep. Um, just wouldn't have imagined. You know, I was just like, well, I'm not going to play. <laughs> so when I got the call that I was in, it was I think it was two days before the game, and I remember calling Dad and me and Dad just crying on the phone. Oh, like, Dad, awesome. we just got – we just bawled our eyes out. And um, leading into that game, I think you got you got five wristbands that we were playing at Icon Park, and um, we got five wristbands that you got to give to friends and family. And I remember having to go around and being to people like Dad basically texted me and said, "Hey, I need seventeen wristbands." <laughs> and I went, "I don't know if I can get seventeen wristbands." But the, the club helped us out and ended up getting seventeen wristbands. And Great. I. Five of my best mates from Perth come over. My nan, my aunties, uncles, Amazing. everyone, everybody. Oh, over all these trip. people came over, and I, I didn't know who was coming, so they all rocked up before the game, and they. Oh shit! That's right. Was all that good. No, continue. Continue um, on. Continue on. Yeah. No. And I. Yeah. So they all rock up before the game, and we did a jumper presentation as if you know it's everyone's first game. So we all on the field. Long and presentation. Long, well, <laughs> they literally, the coach stood up and went, here's your friends and family. They've got your jumpers. Go ahead. Go and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can't I do it. And I was blubbering like a baby. There's videos somewhere and I'm bawling my eyes out and and it was so it was so emotional. And I reckon I got two touches that game. Like oh, I was, doesn't I was, matter. I was put in as an as a undersized ruck. I probably played 40% you played, game you time. You played ruck? Yeah, my first year. I was drafted in utility. Played as an undersized <laughs> ruck behind Emma King, who's <laughs> the tallest female in the league. Um, but so, yeah, that was a rough year, but yeah. loved every second. And um, I remember that experience. It's still the best experience of my life. Um I've got the date of it tattooed on my arm because it, it is probably the, the best day of my life where there was – we were expecting, I think, 12,000 to rock up to this AFLW game. And we – I remember we went into the change rooms. We warmed up. People were starting to come in and we went into the change rooms. We come out and it is packed. Like – and I look back at videos. I go, I can't it, – it feels like a dream. I can't believe that happened. How many people were there? So they ended up – so it, Gil McLaughlin had to go outside at, I think, quarter time and there were thousands of people outside oh and he had, had to say, guys, I, I'm so sorry, we, we, you can't get in. There were people climbing over the fences, wow. jumping as if it was a music festival. That's awesome. Yeah, like it was – and he had to go – Goes, it's like a safety hazard. People up the aisle, so people that jumped and then would, were sitting on the stairs trying to watch and – like we it's got like we old got school space. VFL no, days. No, no, yeah. proper and, and – like you'd look up and you couldn't see a, a free seat. It was the most insane, and we had no idea. So we ran, we ran out to go through the batter, and it was just like you look up and you Ugh. just go, "Oh my god!" And your nerves just, just hit a whole nother level because you you couldn't have scripted it like that. And I remember, yeah, the first bounce and the first hit, and you just hear this. 
ooh, and it, and it was like shivers. <laughs> it was insane because it was in like because you know you're at, and the, and that noise is for you guys. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and that game we got spanked and Carlton won, and but we walked around the the boundary line afterwards, and it was it wasn't like there was like a winning team. It's probably the one. Day ever again Everyone that was Carlton just happy. and Collingwood would get along. Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah. Because everybody was around. happy. We had Carlton, Carlton play it, like uh, supporters high fiving us. We had people crying. Like there oh, were amazing. there was a so one of my friends was sitting next to a guy who was forty years old and bawling bawling his eyes out. And he she went are you, like Are you okay? And he goes My sister a couple of weeks ago passed away from cancer and she would have loved to see this. Yeah. And and I'm here because she didn't get oh. to. So like it, that day meant so much more than just my first game. That Absolutely. day was just – it for everyone, it meant something different. Oh. So uh, it's like the coolest thing ever. It's probably the one thing that I think I talk about and I get – like it brings emotion. You're giving me goosebumps. Yeah, so like it, gives, it's, it will always bring emotion up in me because I can't believe I got to be a part of that. Oh, it's amazing. That's mm. so cool. And then your breakout year was like 2021, 2020, 2021? 2021. Tell us about that year. Was there any like memorable games, any funny stories, anything like that from, um, from that period? 2021 was a good year. The year before wasn't as good. Yeah. Um, so the I'd probably underperformed for my first three years. Like I didn't know but how also, to – They've got you in the fucking ruck. Well, honestly. that's it. No, only the first year. I'd made the move to the back line okay, after good, that. Good, Thank good, God. Good. The first year was the ruck. Um, so, yeah, no, the first three years I probably un- underperformed. And it was just a case of, you know, you don't know nutrition-wise. You don't understand everything. You don't know how to how to gym. I'm still figuring that out. I've never gymmed in my life. Um, so it was just like a concoction of things. Um, but yeah, probably it was. There was also no playbook for you guys to go by as well because you're the first. Like you're yeah. the first to do all. To they do were still all figuring of it. out how do we do this mm. with female footballers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 2020 it was shaping up to look like it was going to be my breakout year, and I was training really well. I came back pretty fit, all this sort of thing, and um, that was having a really good preseason. You know, they went, "Oh, you're flying rooms." I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> that old chestnut. <laughs> Uh, scratch match before round one against North Melbourne at Arden Street and I tore my MCL and that had me out for the first five rounds of the season, right? So, shit, I'm in really good nick and, and I've just lost it all. You know, you, yep. you can't, you're and not you running for a little while, prep, all that prep all and you lose it like that and it's so frustrating. And then um, I, I come back by chance, my my first game of the year, I've, I've nailed it. The first game is against Frio at Fremantle Oval. So I'm like, yes, get to go home, like get to play in front of the home crowd. And it was probably the best game. I think uh, I think I had like – this is how I was going. I think I had 13 touches off like off the back line and it was like the best game that I'd played of AFLW yep. yet. And, Dad, and it was the first time Dad was like, there she is because – Dad was so frustrated up to this point because he he knew I was so much better than I was showing. And it was the first little glimmer I showed that it was like, that's Fuck, weird, she can yeah. play at this level. Come on, Rubes, that's her, you know? Yep. And so he was like, yes, this is so exciting. So played that game, was pretty up and about, felt pretty good. Um, and then the following game, we are playing at Marvel Stadium against Melbourne. That's so sick, yeah. So cool. Mum and Dad were like, all right, we're coming over. Like I was playing – Fine, we'll come over, we'll watch you. This is awesome. You're playing on Marvel Stadium. It was before like a men's all-star game. So yep. it was a really cool game to go watch. And um, first 40 seconds, I I mark it. So I'm on early, yep. right? She's, she's got a mark in the first 40 Excellent. seconds. I mark it. I turn. I go to run back off the mark. I trip over my own feet. I put my <laughs> left hand out to stop my fall and I break my wrist. Oh, so, no. so I've done no. this and as I'm down, Bree Davey, who's just come to the club, the best player in the league, I hear her downfield because I'm trying to play this off. I'm so embarrassed, right? I get up. She's going, get up, Bree, because there's players on down the line and I'm thinking – I've just fucking broke my wrist here. Like, I know, right? My so she's spraying me. Is. She's spraying me. And I hear Ash Brazzle, right, superstar netball footballer, yeah. in the back line. She's behind me. I just hear her crying of laughter, right? <laughs> so I, I get up and I'm, like, sort of holding my wrist and I'm trying oh. to play it off because I'm so embarrassed. So my face is like, like this. Like, oh, that was embarrassing. But I've fucked up my wrist here. And I just kick it along down the line. I couldn't get off for a few minutes. So I'm still there going, oh, With a broken off. A broken wrist. Stuff. With no was, sympathy. Everyone's no, laughing at you and yelling at you. yelling at me. And I come off and I go, 
like I think I've done something. We did a few tests. I was like, look, adrenaline kick in. Let me go back out there. <laughs> Went back out there. Marking contest. Bang. I was like, no, nah, that's me done. Sure enough, broken wrist. So mum and dad flew all the way to Melbourne to watch me play 40 seconds Great. on Marvel Stadium. Great 40 seconds. Hey, yeah. but a good story yeah. of the 40 well, that's seconds. It. Yeah, though, and so. there's a video there. There's a video somewhere, but. Yeah, not not my finest <laughs> moment, and that was that season done. <laughs> done. So that was my twenty twenty. And then from uh, from that season, stuff started really click for you. So you have a dual um, all Australian uh, selection now, which is amazing. In terms of like preparation and actually what it takes to be an AFLW athlete, run us through what your schedule looks like in terms of uh, training. Uh, let's do training first, and then we'll go like game Are we day stuff. Are talking in season or off season? Let's go, well, let's do what you're doing now in off season, and then we'll talk what it sort of changes for in season for sure. Yeah, so off season, you kind of go off on your own. Yep. Um, so for me, what it would look like, it looks pretty different this last off season because I was working full time with Fox, so yep. which was the first off season that I've done this. Um, so for me, it was... Monday morning, early before work, um, full body gym, and then I'm, w- I'm working all day. Then Tuesday, I'd go, I'd work in the morning, go in the, in the afternoon, and do a skills and a running session, yep. which would generally be like you're, you're clocking up your K's, so you're like aerobic. Um, and then Wednesday, I would be in the gym Wednesday morning, work all Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, same thing, work all day, go in, and that was my speed session. So Such skills a speed schedule. session. Yeah. I was I was loving it because yeah. I was loving working full time because it was exciting for me. Yep. So I, and like I love my job. Um, but yeah, Thursday in afternoon skills um, speed session. Friday morning gym, um, and then work. Saturday, I'd probably go. I'd just go for a run. I'd stay away from the club because yep. I'm in the club five days a week because it's five minutes from the office so it was easy um so Saturday morning I'd just I'm living in St Kilda so I'd just go run like 8k down the beach and just you know do do a run that made me feel good whether it was like fartleks or something like that but it was still building my tank um and Sundays off and and that with the weekends pretty much this whole off season I've used these weekends I've just gone down the coast with my mates and just surfed all weekend because I'm like that's just that's just that's just that mentally you just need to switch off from that the one thing that like filled me up and even at that you you can I can you think about it as rest and you're like that is not rest no you're still doing you're still you're cooking yourself. Um, and then with like the change in your preparation and maybe what the last couple of off seasons have looked like when you've been performing so unbelievably well and you know having all this great improvement, what do you reckon are the bits that you've actually changed? Is there anything like day one that you kind of wish that you – oh, sorry, now that you're doing that you kind of wish you were doing day one? I'm I, sure there's plenty of I things. I wish things clicked so much earlier because yeah. I go, oh, you, you like you wasted – three years there you know you give yourself that first year because you got to find your feet but you go oh I just wish things clicked earlier because I could have been a lot more influential in the game in those first few years um but that that 2020 season that I spoke about where I just had a stinker and then came back 2021 that off season that was COVID obviously yep. and I got out of Melbourne uh I got into Perth half an hour before borders closed. So wow. I was very lucky. Dad was like, I booked you a flight. I was actually at Mad Monday. We uh, oh, the, the season had just got cancelled. So I'm, I'm blind. <laughs> and I get the call from Dad. They've just found out that um, the, the borders are closing. And Dad goes, get home. And you're pack absolutely up your shit. Smashed, you're on a flight yeah. at 11 a.m. And I'm going, oh, uh, my God. I'm, I literally. Still in a fucking costume or something. No, right? dead set. I'm dressed up. I'm in, the, I'm in a pub in Richmond. And I'm just like, oh, my God. So I go home. I've been living there for four, like four years at this stage. I had to pack up four years of shit oh. in – it was like – 10 hours that I had to pack it up. So I'm like, I reckon I had three breakdowns. I'm on the floor of my bedroom. It's like, <laughs> how am I going to do this? And so got on the floor. You have a lot of breakdowns. Oh, mate, yeah, emotionally <laughs> unstable. Um, but, yeah, that's so why I went home and I that, – that period, I think it was the nutrition that changed for me. So it's, it's a double-edged sword because – it's something that, and I mean, like, you'd know better than anyone. It's, it's, I, I started counting calories, yep. which helped me. I keep breaking things. Don't worry, just, get, just continue um, on. You're doing great. It's something, <laughs> <laughs> breaking the joint. It's something that, uh, with counting calories, it's so great because you get the, you know, the reward. Like, you literally see it all happen so quickly. Yep. But you can get so obsessed with it that you get an unhealthy relationship with food. Yep. So for me, I was counting calories to a T. I lost five kilos. I was the fittest I'd ever been. I felt and looked better than ever. 
But then I got a really unhealthy relationship with food where if I ate one thing outside of my calories, I felt so guilty. I felt so guilty. I thought it was the end of the world and it it was a real mental battle. Like, Mm -hmm. and it took me to like really just unhealthy. And I think once you start that, I was probably pretty lucky that I was a strong, strong enough mentally to pull myself out of that spot and go, you're not the worst person in the world for eating a cheese and cracker when mum puts out a cheese platter of roofs. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. you're all right. But that's literally where I was at is I would have like some hummus and crackers and be like, that wasn't in my fitness pal. You know, yeah. how bad is that? Yeah. And I think that's something that I had to learn to get over. And it's, I think. Why do you a, think, why do you think that got, to that point for you because you see these results you lose five kilos in this amount of time you're smashing it and i was working so hard in the gym with um matt DeLau, my east Fremantle strength and conditioning coach he took me on and i was training at home and was so good and i think it's just when you're looking when you're doing it so precisely you're tracking it and you're all you're looking at is numbers and so you start thinking of, you know, it's good to be mindful and that's probably where I'm at now is I'm mindful of, right, how much is in this, yeah. right? And I, I know around about what my body needs. But if I was to look at it every single day and go, this is what I need, blah, 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 I would probably go back into that place yeah. because I'd feel guilty for eating anything outside of that. Yep. Um, so for me at that, you know, I'm – and that's particularly for, I guess, female athletes, your, your body is the first thing people comment on whether you like it or not and I've, I've learned just not to look at – social media and stuff like that now because that's a a lot of what female athletes deal with but um yeah I think you're feeling the best you've ever felt and you it's just a mental thing you can't actually explain it it's just the way the brain is wired is you go oh my god what what, what I reckon that I've found like with myself as well and also like clients that I work with um you know for for the last few years it's so easy to find someone else or, or someone else that's similar to you to compare yourself to. It's just so it's so easy to do so, um, you know, with social media, Instagram. You know, you're seeing all the highlights of everyone doing this, doing that, um, and you just got to actually remember that you just got to do what's best for you, and you got to work out what's actually going to make you know you you know look look how you know look good and and you feel more confident in yourself more than anything else rather than actually you know so much what you look 100 percent. and i think for me like it's so funny talking about the comparing like every female in my life yeah is is a pretty small person my mum is a tiny little unit she is yeah My, my my two sisters have completely different body types to me they've got these like hourglass figures like i'm built like my brother uh, we you know we're like short torso strong i wouldn't say you're built no, like your brother no, but yeah. <laughs> just a bit more beer than me. sorry but like, sorry Jay. um but like i'm built like i'm strong you know what i mean so that's what my body is for and yeah. i love it and i've learned to love it but you obviously as a as your brain goes oh like it should look like this and then as an athlete you look at other your teammates and you go why do you like yes. that? no i don't look like that um so yeah that's something like i feel like this is all such like mental hurdles that I had to come over. And the way that I've sort of brought myself out of that is just balance. Yep. So like for me, I found, all right, I'm like, I calorie count. So not to the T like I used to, but like Monday You've to just Friday, got an idea I'm of stricter. What's going on. Yep. I, I, I like for one week, I'll eat the same thing Monday to Friday pretty much. And then weekends, I, I don't look at it. I'm cautious, I'm aware, but it like I go out and I, and I enjoy my my food you know what i mean I, i'll go out for dinner or i'll go get you know a almond croissant with my coffee you have to. these sort of yeah. things yeah and it's that lo- that life balance and when you get those you learn to love them even more so i think that Absolutely. is kind of what has pulled me out of that but going back to your question i guess like that nutrition change is what really made something flick for me and working with that east Fremantle snc coach matt delau that was that flicked me into gear like it takes i mean it takes a good coach and you'd see through the AFL boys that you've worked with, Luke and Trey and these boys working with you and then coming back and having the best preseason they've ever had. Yep. That's what it was for me was working with the SNC coach one-on-one and coming back and understanding this is what I'm doing in this exercise and yep. understanding how your body can work, like how you can make it work the best for you. Um, and it so really just comes down to trying things as well, isn't it? So, but, but, And like you said, oh, you know, the first few years I wish I did this, wish I did that. But – it's very much just like a big learning curve for, and everybody's going to be very different. So like, you know, your S and C program is going to be very different to 
and you know another AFL um, W athletes out there. So it's just about sort of what works for you and how you actually get the best out of yourself as well. Hey? Yeah, absolutely. No, hundred percent. What about like recovery side of things? Do you have anything that you do to like just take your mind off in terms of um, the pressure for game days? Um, you know, getting too too much into you know the club doing too much training. What do you kind of do to chill yourself out? You mentioned surfing before. Is there yeah, anything else? Yeah, I would say going down the coast is yeah. literally my saviour. I'm very lucky that my best mates have a caravan down in Anglesey. Unreal. And um, we can't spend a weekend without each other. So um, they're the Davy sisters, so Bree Davy. Yes. Best player in the league. Uh, <laughs> come back season for her this season. Watch out so after good. her ACL. But, um, and her two sisters, Stefan Hall as well. So we all did Europe together and we – just are inseparable ever since. And they've got the caravan down there. They all surf as well. So we go down there most weekends, chill out. I, I definitely notice when I haven't done that enough. Um, I just – I'm like unbalanced. So it's so important for me to just like get out, get Switch to the water. Off, Even if I can't thing. surf, like going for a swim in the ocean. I, like I live in St Kilda and, I mean, I don't th- really think you can call that a beach. I'm not sure if you've gotten there yet. No, I've seen St Kilda before. Yeah, Ain't nothing you can't anything call it a Perth. beach. Nah. <laughs> but um, even just like being near the coast, it just relaxes Makes me. Makes you feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gives me somewhat of a taste of home, I guess. Yeah, um, great. So that's probably the most relaxing part um, from that end. That's awesome. And then – You've touched on it all throughout um, us chatting just here, but you've got a great gig over at uh, Fox Sports and you're doing presenting. Everywhere I see, you're popping up somewhere, whether it's, you know, special comments. We are at the footy the other day. You're doing the, 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 the cafe, special oh, comments gosh. on the game. You're up on the big screen. You're bloody everywhere, right? How did that all come about? Um, because, you know, you, you speak so well. You're super entertaining. How did that actually come about uh, early on? So I'm very – basically, the AFL – W set up, well, not the AFLW, but a very powerful woman in the TV industry, Siobhan McKenna. She's, I think, the head of Sky News, yep. um, which Fox Sports News falls under. And she set up a program for one AFLW player a year um, with Fox Sports News. And it was, you don't need any experience. Um, you, you don't need to have studied. Oh, well, it, you, it helps if you've got experience. My experience was that I've always been happy to be a dickhead on camera. Like you could look, <laughs> you could go back all through yeah. Collingwood's fine. Yeah, honestly, the, the TikTok that comes to mind, oh. I, I like, I actually, as much as I'm on social heaps, so I post flat out. I actually don't use it very much. Like, yeah. through, but one of the videos that I've saved because it's fucking hilarious is the, you dancing with the, you know, the shotgun video that you did. Oh, the, that the is, AFLW That ocean. honestly sends me. That went me. viral. That went that nuts. Was- like, every time I'll put it up, that is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Every time I, I see know. it, like, if I'm just going back through the videos, I say, I, I go, know oh what? my we God. Did, like, that's just, that was like our pregame routine. It's like, just like dance around where, I'm like, for me, when I play best is when I'm just doing my doing thing fun. in the change yeah. rooms, I'm um, getting around everyone, I'm acting like an idiot. That's when, like, when I'm relaxed, I know that I'm going to have a good game. Yeah, good. Um, so that was literally just that. Yep. And that was kind of like our song yes. of the season. Um, but, yeah, no, basically Siobhan McKenna set up this uh, role with Fox Sports News for one AFLW player a year and I was very fortunate to get it for um, starting last June. And, yeah, as I said, no experience, just – you know, a little bit with Collingwood where they've, you know, the black and white show, you know, yep. things that just always put my hand up to do things. And, um, yeah, they, they chose me. It was a full interview process. It was across the whole league. So I was very fortunate to get it and I work with an incredible team um, as well who I just learned so much off and they're so patient with me, especially early on. Um, but, yeah, basically they just – there's so many opportunities from it. Our show is AFL Tonight, so – that's where majority of our work comes from during the footy season. Yep. Um, but obviously when it's outside of footy season, being Fox Sports News, it's, uh, all you know, sorts of stuff. all sorts of stuff. So what, what events have you been to? Um, so I was I was doing a lot of the Oz Open. So we were but we you're sitting in the office, but like it was such a good time period because you're literally sitting there, legs up, watching tennis, waiting to do the story, basically. You're waiting for an outcome. So yeah. Um, you it was very very cruisy but you had an accreditation so you could go in whenever That's you wanted awesome. and did stuff, you meet any players or anything no no nah, so i didn't have to do any like i didn't do any of the interviewing and stuff mine was more so right oh once the game's fun done do your comments yeah 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 write the story on it and edit it and go there so it's all this stuff that i never knew i'd be able to do all the editing and um soundboarding and stuff like that it's just 
you know, I remember at the start being like, oh, there is no way I'm going to be able to learn to do this. And now I'm almost a year in and I'm very lucky because they've extended my contract for another year. So good. Um, which was just the best thing ever because I was meant to be finished in June and they were like, no, nope, we want to hold you on for another year. Too so good. We're keeping you. Yeah. yeah well, I was just stoked. So um, get to now that I'm actually just – I don't feel like I'm a – a work experience kid anymore. I feel like I'm, I'm just another reporter. So um, good. But, yeah, it's just the best fun. I, game days, I'm doing, yeah, stuff. You just pick up things where you can. So whether it's special comments for SEN like on the weekend and, um, you know, whatever it is, AFLW commentating for Fox, it's, yeah, wherever there's the opportunity, I'm always willing to put my hand up because I think, you know, I was originally studying primary teaching and I loved it. But then as soon as I would do something, a media gig, I went, oh, that's this where my passion lies. Yep. Like that's – I get adrenaline from it. I, I feel f- fulfilled. Yep. And so I stopped studying priority teaching because I went, I don't think I'll feel as fulfilled doing that as I do feel doing this. Yeah, amazing. And uh, there's obviously all the great events that you've done that have been, you know, really good. But I'm sure there's probably some moments that you're like, holy – when it's like live TV uh, and you're going, no, I better nail you this one. Was there any good ones that you've like messed up at all? The, or? Like the li- live TV is – that's right. You're very – if anything, it's like are you. I'm getting more used to it. It's still something when not I as did, much the commentating, but the storytelling, yes. having to tell a, a sporting news story, and you go, shit, I need to think of the. I remember this fact, this fact. That's hard. Yes. So it's almost you feel like a bit more of a robot. Yeah. But what is the worst part of the job is doorstops. So when athletes don't want to talk to you, but you need to, and they're on their way into scans, and you need to go, mate, we have a quick yarn. Do you to do us. that? Do you do that? I oh. had to. I know. I know. And I'm thinking. That's a stitch up to I do know, that job. I know. That's but on a Monday up. morning oh. when there's not much else to talk about and you go, you've got a show on Monday night and you need to create a story, like you go, okay, I know this person's injured. You need to go. And they'd have to send me because you've got reporters everywhere else. And I remember my <laughs> first time doing it. It's genuinely, it makes me cringe <laughs> so bad. It's my worst. It's the worst part of the job. And especially because like I'm a player as well. So, so I you know, kind of know what that feels. Guys, yeah, but yeah. I know a lot of these guys as well. And I'm, I'm putting, I'm gone. Sorry guys. I know you don't want to talk to me while you're going in to get your ankle scanned. It's the last thing you want to do, but we have a word. Yeah. Um, but I remember my first time doing it and there was a bunch of, there was rich, it was when Richmond were all getting injured. And I think it was the captain, Toby Nankervis and, Ivan Soldo, right? They look pretty similar. They're tall, dark hair. Oh, They're no. both Richmond <laughs> players. I didn't watch their game that weekend, so I didn't know what the injuries were, right? And Ivan Soldo had hurt his thumb yep. and Toby Nankervis had hurt his knee. And it was there was people coming from every direction. I was like, which one am I going to get? Whatever. I walk up to Ivan Soldo and... I asked him how his knee was. Oh, no. <laughs> so no. I go, I said, yeah, I go, the knee's fine. I, no, he literally <laughs> – so I go up and I go – it was my first one. I go, how's the knee feeling? And he goes, yeah, the knee's good. <laughs> <laughs> And you've gone, oh, that's good. Oh, sweet. He's, he's good, I everybody. <laughs> I went back. I, the, he walked in because he didn't want to borrow me. Anyway. He's walked in and I looked at the camera guy, Esky, and he's in stitches. And we just we got back to the office and everyone saw it. And I was like, that was – That's so good. I'd never make, never make me do that again. And it was only the first time. And I was like, everyone, everyone – I mean, I'm sure everyone started Have you actually that. got the footage of you doing that I somewhere? It's got to be somewhere. Like, they obviously didn't use that. No. Yeah, I reckon it might have gone on the bounce or something like that. Yeah. I think the bounce boys <laughs> usually try and stitch you up. But, yeah, it's it was – that was like – especially because it was one of my first days as well. I was just like, that was horrifying. That's awesome. No, that's hilarious. Oh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, so I'm, I'm, bad. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, this year coming up, um, what are you working on personally? Um, have you got anything else, you know, any other projects, any, uh, anything else that's sort of in the works that you can talk about? Or um, For me, I mean, Fox is taking up a lot of my it time be, at the yeah. moment. So um, – I'm dropping down now pre-season. It was first day of pre-season today. Great. So um, they feel good. Ease us. Yeah, it felt really good. Ease us into it. Um, we've got time trials tomorrow, so stay oh. tuned. Um, Glad I got you today then. Doing yeah. that one. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, for me, I, I'll drop down to three days doing Fox. I'm really excited as we lead into the AFLW season. Um, I'm going to be doing some sit-down interviews with a few, uh, like with AFLW players across the league. Um, there's some really great stories that – people don't know and a lot of people just don't know AFLW players full stop. So I'm in a very fortunate position that I can 
I'm able to go out and talk to them and I guess tell their stories, um, which will all go up on on Fox Sports News and AFL Amazing. tonight. So I'm pretty excited to do that. They've kind of given me free reign in that, and that'll begin over the next few weeks. Oh, but so good. Otherwise, just. Ticking along, enjoying Doing footy and good. yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's been so good to catch up and chat and uh, I, I, honestly such an inspirational story and I think there's so many people out there that are going to absolutely love hearing this. So uh, thank you so much for uh, coming and doing the uh, pod with me. So good to see you. Uh, good luck with the year. Um, and yeah, can't wait to see what um, what the future holds for, uh, for Ruby. Thank you, mate. It's been a pleasure. So good.